Welcome to the Big Movement Podcast. If you're ready to create results and make huge strides in your business, finances, personal development, and health, then you're in the right place. Pushing past excuses and powering through procrastination can be a challenge alone. Here, you'll get the support, tools, and knowledge you need to get to the level you desire in your business and life. Let's get started with your host, Byron Ingram. And welcome to another episode of the podcast. Today, we have Anna Lundberg, who is a business consultant and personal coach who writes, coaches, and leads workshops to help ambitious individuals achieve their full potential in their professional and personal lives. She's a big believer in stepping outside of your comfort zone. So we're going to learn a little bit more about how she does this and so much more. So, Anna, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Sure, definitely. So how did you get into this arena here? Because everybody has a different path, a different journey of what gets them to enter that entrepreneurial life. Yeah, and I guess it's never a straight path, is it? Um, no, so, not even um, <laughs> I, I say that I'm a personal coach and business consultant. And I'm quite happy with that being quite succinct in terms of sort of a, a thing that you say to people when they ask you. And it does capture most of what I do, but I guess there's a lot more to it, as is often the case these days. Um, and it's really a portfolio career in the sense that I write, I speak, I coach, I train, I facilitate. Um, my background is actually in brand management and marketing. So... Or in fact, before that, I studied um, politics and economics, and I wanted to um, help children in Africa. <laughs> I wanted to work at the UN and, and, and work in um, the development sector. Um, and then after my master's degree, I ended up working at um, Procter & Gamble, where I stayed um, for seven years, a big American and multinational company. Um, and I loved it. It was never really what I wanted to do. I sort of, as I said, ended up there. It wasn't related to my degree, and I'd never really known what, um, what marketing was, and I hadn't studied business or anything. Um, but, you know, it was a fantastic experience. Uh, the colleagues that I met were absolutely amazing friends for life. And I think um, to a large extent, the work I did there and the contacts I made and the things I learned have opened up the doors and made everything I'm doing today possible. So, you know, I certainly don't regret it. Um, but in 2013, I um, initially took a sabbatical to travel across South America by myself. Um, and then halfway through that, after a lot of sort of reflection and thinking and reading and, and um, pondering the meaning of life, I called up um, the company and I quit. Um, and I didn't really have anything lined up, so it was quite a scary process. And initially I started consulting independently, so doing basically what I'd be doing at P&G, but for other clients. Um, and I still, so that's now evolved, so I still continue with elements of that. Um, I'd say initially I sort of rebelled against the whole corporate world of marketing because I'd quit that and I sort of wanted to leave it behind, but I've found my peace with it now. I really love it and of course I have a lot of background and expertise in it, so it's great that I can use that now. So I still advise startups and entrepreneurs on their brand strategy. Um, I run you know, both virtual and in-person sort of training workshops on different elements of marketing, um, but also as part of my process, since I left p and G, I I trained and certified as a life coach, as many people now do. <laughs> um, wow. I, you know, and I, um, I originally did it, to be honest, just because sort of as part of my own personal development, I'm just really interested in um, understanding more about myself and so on. But in doing that, I just loved it so much. Um, and I've now added that to the portfolio. So I work um, mainly individually with clients, but I also run workshops and, again, write articles. Um, as I said, really essentially about getting what you want, whether that's from your career um, your business or sort of life overall, I guess. And you know, it's fascinating you say that because I think everybody comes across to, you know, a, along that path of what leads them to where they want to be at in a different way of like, is you embrace the life coaching as that personal development? But when you look at business, you think about startups and entrepreneurs, how many people need that mindset work in order to make their business grow? Because you can show them all the different tools and the strategies, but until they believe it's possible, they're still stuck at the starting line. It's such an interesting point. And I think uh, we did actually learn some coaching. So at Procter & Gamble, we, as part of sort of managing and, and coaching our teams, we were taught the grow model, which is the sort of famous concept within coaching. But I, I, to be honest, I didn't really know what a coach was. I certainly wouldn't have considered getting a coach myself. And it's quite interesting because of course, through that um, process of uh, learning and training to be a coach, we were then Part of what I loved about that course was that I um, peer coaching was a core cool part of it. So you both coached other people as part of the training and you were coached. And I, I guess I sort of thought I didn't need it, <laughs> as many of us do. You know, we're independent and we're strong and capable and certainly don't need to ask for help. Um, but the results I got were just amazing, really life changing, to be honest, um, in a couple of unexpected areas. And since then, you know, I continue um, working with a coach for much of the year. And yeah, I think that's why a lot of people who experience coaching then go on because they're so passionate about it. They see so much of 
what you can achieve with it that they go on to um, to become coaches themselves. Right. It's it's interesting that you say that as well because if you look at the number of coaches, that, you know, especially the swimming they've talked to, they have a similar background because of that where they either went through a coaching program like yourself thought well wow this is fascinating or what tended to happen is more often was somebody had hired a coach and said this is profound i and they had an epiphany i need to do this to, to get their message out there so it's fascinating that you say that in terms of how that played into where you are today mm, i mean it's definitely a very organic process and as i say it's still evolving i'm really you know i think often we think things are going to happen right away and we have that big aha moment, we quit our jobs, oh my God, this is gonna be amazing, I'm gonna achieve all my dreams, I'm so brave. And then suddenly you realize right. it's not just that one decision, right? It's the process and, oh no, this was much harder than I realized and, oh, this is not working, I'm not actually enjoying this, oh, maybe I should. And it's just, you know, it's an ongoing evolution. So, you know, it's four years ago now since I quit and now I'm really happy with sort of the different elements I'm creating, but I've certainly still got a long way to go and I'm sure that will evolve as well over the coming years. Oh yes, well, if you think about it, there's the that misnomers like you're saying of people just assume the moment i open my doors there's going to be this big flood of people coming in the door and i'm set but when they do it all they hear are crickets and they might get one of their neighbors kind of say so you're in business for yourself cool have fun and that's about it <laughs> i really believe honestly that sort of resilience and just commitment consistency keeping going is one of the key drivers of success on your own you know there's all those statistics of 86 percent whatever of businesses fail in their first year but i think if you make it through that and if you have realistic expectations often you know if you started as a side hustle as they say now rather than as i did perhaps <laughs> quitting cold turkey if you don't have sort of the buffer but giving yourself right. the time and you know a lot of the stuff i do has taken to, you know i write articles i put my name out there and it does take time for that to sort of stick so expecting to suddenly within one day have, you know, hundreds of clients or get those six finger incomes or whatever it is that, that some people promise, you know, it's, it's quite unrealistic. So I really think, you know, just keep keep on plodding along, <laughs> keep on trying things and, and um, stay with it. And I believe it will work. Right. And, you know, when you say that, it I think where people, they fall into that trap of the hype marketing, as I like to call it, mm. with the gurus out there who say, oh, I'm going to show you how you can make six figures right away. But what people are not being told is that there was a decade of experience leading up to that one moment. So when they put that course out there saying, oh, yes, I'm tapping into my 10 years where I did this, this, this and this. So all these things that are there. So you might have had someone who doesn't have that background yet. And you can't use the same playbook. Exactly. And I think we tend to compare ourselves in general, but certainly we compare ourselves to people who are, yeah, as you say, 10 years further down the line than we are. So um, you sort of compare your early you and your business to their already successful, well-established business. And that's just an un unrealistic and impossible comparison for you to, to live up to. So again, being realistic in terms of it's going to take time and, and you know, just keep, keep on working on it and, and learning things and trying things and having high expectations by all means, but also being patient with yourself. Right, exactly. That everybody has that first win out there and I can remember going to different seminars over the, the past several years and so many of the, the people running them and you know these are seminars with you know thousands of people in there and they would have that similar story when they first got started like when they're having that initial seminar they're excited they're pumped they're expecting a lot of people in there and they might have 12 and half of them are like will it be like their mom their brother, a couple friends, they said, hey, can you come sit in here so the room's not so empty? And uh -huh. that's how they all got started. Yeah. There you go. It's great here. And I mean, the great thing is that people are beginning to share those stories. You know, you do have more of the behind the scenes and vulnerability, authenticity, all these things are buzzwords, but people are sort of sharing a glimpse into how hard things are. So that does help, I think, people to realize and not just see that glossy kind of veneer of success. Right. I, I, that's something more has of that authenticity has to come out there in the marketplace to let people know that the first year it's going to be tough that unless you've spent a background and you and this knowledge of making these things work it's not just going to be as simple as you open your doors and ta-da there it is you're going to be figuring out so many things such as the business processes of how are you actually going to do these things in business of what are the ways that 
or going to work most effectively to get your name out there because for some things it's not going to work effectively i like to jokingly tell people because it's, a, it's an example people can really relate to it's some businesses are going to be great on facebook but others not so much so let's say that someone's business was an emergency plumber i don't really care that i'm not going to go on to facebook at three in the morning to ask like hey is there a plumber available you're going to Google or whatever search platform and you're going to look for whoever comes up at the top and answers the phone. Mm. Well, that's because I mean, luckily a different for way me, of getting there. Yeah. I mean, for me, luckily, that's where my sort of brand fundamentals work from from um, my corporate time really helps because we always ask, you know, who's the customer and where they're receptive to your message and all those things, all those boring questions that, that a lot of people skip, I think, when they're just starting up and they're not very strategic and they just kind of oh my God, I have to be everywhere and so on. And I think that isn't helped with all the, I guess all the actually, you know, podcasts and webinars and emails we're getting from all these different gurus and it's just completely overwhelming. So I think, you know, choose one or two people who you really respect and sort of um, can relate to and then listen to what they have to say, sort of stick with them, learn a particular thing at a time and just focus because otherwise there's just so much noise going on um, and it's impossible to do everything. And, and probably, as you said, not the right thing to do everything, right? You don't need to be on every social platform, every podcast and webinar and YouTube and everything else. So a bit of right. helps. Right. Exactly. It, it's insanity. If you think, if you look at your newsfeed on Facebook and you'll see ad after ad, a person like, join my course, I've cracked the code, the six secrets to whatever, and you see it all. And people will buy course after course after course. And it's mind boggling. And you, you wonder, when, if all these people are buying courses, how many of them are actually taking action versus just being in per, a state of perpetual learning? Well, that, that's a great point about action. And I mean, I'm a huge fan of learning, so I'm all about learning. <laughs> but as you say, oh, there's yes. a point at which you have to take action. And, you know, we sit around sort of waiting to feel motivated. We think of all the sort of things that can go wrong. We have all these fears and, oh, God, I've just got to learn the one. If I could just do this one more course, it'll teach me the secret. And I think that's why people are hungry for these experts. And I have to say, I hate those <laughs> ads that you're talking about, but I can compl I almost fall for them myself because they're great at, <laughs> you know, really they've really um, sort of perfected that copy to make you think, oh, wow, they, they must know something that I don't and they've got the secret. And maybe they do. Um, but at the end of the day, as you said, it's not necessarily going to work for you. They've had a different journey to the point where they are now. It's different timing, different person, different goals, different strengths, different challenges. Um, so, you know, that you, you might be able to get something from that. But really just... And I think, you know, people like Gary Vee and stuff are all about, you know, just just do it. Just go out there. Stop listening to all those gurus. Just try something. See, you know, you'll eventually learn how Facebook ads work or don't work for your business. And and just trying things actually could be much more effective than, than as you said, sitting at home, just paying for another course that's going to give you the six uh, secret steps to the six-figure income. Right. Exactly. You know, speaking of Facebook ads, you know, it's so many people, I don't want to say they make it harder than it needs to be. But it, it all goes back down to once you spend enough time to understand who exactly your audience is, that, that ideal client, and you really get inside someone's head, everything else starts falling into place of, well, if I know who this person is, what type of copy should I have? Okay, what images are they going to relate to? And then build a figure out their targeting. Congratulations, you figured out the hardest part. But people want to overcomplicate. Like, well, here's my secret hack to making your ad stand out. Like, it's called being relevant more than anything else mm -hmm. and people forget about that yeah you're right I think we do make things more complicated than than we need to sometimes <laughs> and at the end of the day you're certainly when I work with entrepreneurs I always say you know you're the expert of your business you're the one who has the passion for this idea you've presumably got the industri industry experience you've you know you've researched this you know what you're doing you're the one who's going to live with this business so you need to be making the decision your choices I can advise on certain strategies and things that I've seen work before but really you then need to make the choices that you feel are right for your business oh yes exactly you know I think that's where people they go wrong it's they detach themselves from the outcome so that way they don't have to feel personally responsible if it didn't work oh well it didn't work because they didn't do a good job like uh, no it's like if you're working with somebody they need to have a vested interest in what you're doing otherwise nothing happens and because as you said the business owner knows it better than anybody else with the people i work with i feel like you're the expert here i know all these things of how to get it out there but i need your words i need you to be on camera i need you to show your expertise because i can't write something that will compete with that you've got to bring it out 
Mm. And again, I mean, bringing the, my two worlds together, I guess the coaching approach is very much asking questions and, you know, trusting that the client has all the answers. And that's the same kind of approach, albeit with a bit more sort of knowledge and, and experience and expertise there with the business piece. But really, it's asking questions and people come, sometimes they want you to make a big decision on what business model they should follow, or which name is the best. And that's not really my place to say. So it can be quite tricky because they do just want those sort of answers. Tell me what to do. But um, obviously, I think the more effective approach is to ask those difficult questions and have them answer them. Right. I, I th- like to jokingly say, if, if someone's trying to figure out what should they call a business, think of it like you're naming a child. It's going to have this name for a very long time. So do you want this child to be upset at you later? So choose carefully. <laughs> That's a good uh, comparison. And do you want to ask someone else, what did you call your child? Probably not. Right. Because some people are like, well, I got an idea. And well, don't ask that person. <laughs> because pretty sure I, you're not going to like it. So when it comes to figuring out the, 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 a business or looking at their ideal client, what is it that you recommend that they start looking at? Because you hear people say so many different things about, oh, you should work with these people. Oh, those people there, they're easy money. It's like taking candy from a baby. What do you recommend people do? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, to be honest, I even start before that. And again, it's both in sort of the more life coaching area and the business. It's always thinking about your why and and what success looks like for you, really, because I think sometimes and again, we're comparing to other people. We're chasing after, you know, other successful business. Everyone, everyone always says that their business is the new the new Uber of whatever or the new Airbnb of something where we're constantly sort of trying to achieve kind of a success that someone else has done. Um, and for me, it's all about stripping like, stripping away all those sort of expectations and comparisons and things and getting to the core of what you want to get out of your business, out of your career, out of your life and and um, working towards that. So before you even get to all those marketing things, um, just understanding what you're trying to achieve with the business, I think, is really crucial. It is. I, I think people forget about that. If It's funny that you bring up... You know, people who want to be like the next Uber, the next this, that. To me, people, they follow the Me Too category. And I remember a couple of years ago and talking to people like, oh, I've, I'm working on this social media platform. It's going to be the next Facebook. And my reaction is, uh-huh. And it, it's, it's, it was a hard thing for me to say at times because you don't want to burst somebody's dreams. But it's like, stop trying to be the next of the same thing. You have to be something that stands out because there's only going to be one of a Facebook, one of an Uber. There's one of this that you have to look at. What is it unique that you're bringing to the table? And people forget about that because people don't realize, think about who's number two. It's kind of like if you think of as a great example of who was the first man to walk on the moon? Every, most people can name the person. But if you were to ask, like, who is the fifth person? No one has a clue. <laughs> because no one want, is going to remember the Me Too atmosphere. Because if you think about the brands and the, out there that you recognize, they're doing something that stands out. Mm. Now, that's an interesting point in terms of comparing and trying to be someone else. I think also in terms of ambition, I guess, going back to the point we said before, that it just takes time and you're probably not going to be the next Facebook, <laughs> even if that were possible, you know, it's the statistics are against you. So I think don't give up by all means, again, dream big and so on, but just recognize it is going to be a bit of a slog. And, and again, being passionate about, um, the, you know, your why, what you're really trying to achieve, what's your bigger vision for the industry, for society, whatever it is you're trying to achieve rather than just, oh, I want to get this product out to as many people as possible. And linking that to the client, I guess, that the worst thing people say is, oh, but everybody will use this. And, you know, that's just impossible from a marketing standpoint. First of all, it's not true. <laughs> I think there's no product in the world that, you know, every single person would use. And secondly, it's just not going to be possible for you to design a marketing campaign to reach those people um, and to speak to those people in a relevant way. So I think, um, you know, people are very passionate about their little babies, as you said, about their great business ideas and they think it's going to be the next big thing big thing and it's just being a bit more realistic I guess about what you can achieve and then also more strategic and um, making choices about who those early adopters are going to be or who the people who are really going to need or love your product are going to be. Right I like to tell people there's only one product in the world that it's for everybody and it's called air. And I was thinking air actually yes it's true. Air, As I was saying, it's I was free. <laughs> I did see somebody so, selling um, air in jars. 
on TV. I <laughs> that was a joke, but you know, everything is possible. I saw that, I th that if that's real, this just proves that someone will buy anything, literally. Yes, which, you know, bodes well for us when we're trying to build our businesses. If someone can sell air, we should be able to find someone who buys our products and services, right? <laughs> right, exactly. There's no excuses. Someone is selling air. Like, what are they doing? They're opening a jar, they're closing it, and they're putting it in a, a box and shipping it to somebody. So you, it doesn't get much simpler than that. Mm. But you know, like people have to know who the, they're going to market to and just come to that realization that no matter how much you want to believe that products for everybody it's not going to happen. If you look at major brands out there, if, if look even something like, let's say Walmart, as much as they would love to service every single person in the world, there's people who refuse to step foot in their doors. So they're not going to be able to do that. And you can think of any brand out there, there's a particular market cap to their business where they know that they're gonna penetrate and capture this market share. Getting more than that, probably not going to happen. But you know that's what they can shoot for. So if major corporations understand this, as an entrepreneur, we have to understand the exact same things, knowing that there are going to be people who love what we have, and others are going to go, just not interested. Mm, and that can be quite difficult, I think, because I, I certainly I want to be liked by everybody. <laughs> you know, a lot of us have that kind of people pleaser thing that we want everybody to love us. And oh my god, if whether it's a product or whether it's you know putting myself out there as a coach, the more sort of, um, I don't want to say provocative, but the more you have an opinion on things, the more you express what your point of view is, the more likely it is that you'll get criticism and some people won't agree with or will either even be quite aggressive against your message. Um, and I think that's just something you have to accept as, as part of the journey. And the fact, as you said, that some people hate you probably means hopefully that some people love you as well. So as long as you're polarizing, actually that's a really good thing because it means you're having an opinion, having a point of view and, and you're actually you know, going out there and doing something different. And, and it's important you do that because if you're not getting haters in the world, you're not attracting them, but you're not putting yourself out there enough. Because it's, if you look at any business, any brand out there of, of any substantial size, you're going to have people that will be their raving fans and others I mean, who are just never going to buy anything from them. So it's just part of that process. Mm. I mean, Seth Godin talks about going after the freaks, which is maybe not something you want to self-identify with. But, you know, finding those people right. who are going to be the super early adopters um, and, yeah, who are going to absolutely love and become evangelists for your business, um, which is a very small group of people probably, but the ones who are going to be creating content and sharing and really sort of being ambassadors for your brand. Well, you have to have them because those evangelists are going to be the ones that magnify your message. They're going to become those ambassadors who represent you saying, oh my gosh, you've got to get this one product by them. They're so helpful with it. And it's what makes a difference. Mm. But it's again, that choice and it's difficult because you do want to, you want to serve everybody. You want everybody to buy your product. You don't want to sort of rule anyone out. Um, and it's always right. going to be a hypothesis as well because you never know who's going to love it. Maybe you'll be wrong. So you do some theoretical strategic thinking research, but then you just have to put it out there and see what happens. And you can always sort of evolve that um, definition of the customer as you go. Right, it's interesting you say that. As earlier today, as you know, as recording this, I did a Facebook Live and I'm talking about the value proposition of how do you position yourself in the marketplace. And one of those things I talked about is that, you know, you're, like there's some businesses out there, they have a perpetual sale going on, but what they've done is they've trained their audience to buy things only when they're on sale versus mm. if you don't have sales and you your intrinsic value is what it is, you know that you you have a premium product then in there. So instead of there being sale, you might offer someone a bonus on top of it. Like, oh, well, because it's this time of the year, we're going to give you blank. I think a great example of in the marketplace is Tesla. If you want one of their cars, you're paying whatever price it is. You're not going to get a discount that you would typically find at a lot of dealers in the world. If, like, if the price was 75000 for this particular configuration, guess what? That's what it is. Mm, and the price is an interesting one. I mean, it's tricky for, for you know, coaches to price their services or, or your products and so on. And I think it is a lot about understanding the value. And, you know, whenever you're, let's say, doing a proposal for a client, they'll ask right away, OK, what, what does it cost? And the advice people always give is, you know, but first understand their needs, understand what they're looking for um, have that conversation with them. And this is whether it's, you know, life coaching or business marketing strategy, whatever, um, and really 
understand what they need and how you can support them. And if you can actually serve them and fulfill that need, money almost becomes sort of an afterthought once you've, they've bought into the fact that, oh my God, yes, this is exactly what I need. This person is the right person for me and this is what we need at this juncture. Um, you know, then, then the money be- becomes almost, you know, just a PS, by the way, here's what you need to pay me. They don't care anymore. So I've experienced that myself. I have to say, you know, when it comes to coaching services and um, people are always going to say, oh, that's far too expensive. Um, but I've seen people, you know, spend... Well, certainly, well, one, two, three, four, five, five figure <laughs> sums right on coaches. Mm-hmm. I've been ready to invest a lot of money in people when I've seen and understood that they are exactly what I need at this moment. If they can really um, sort of solve the problem I'm facing in my life, in my business or whatever, then I'm going to be ready to, to fork out that money where I perhaps wasn't ready to even spend, you know, $10 on someone's ebook or something just because I don't see the value it's going to bring me or something. So it's, yeah, it's interesting. The focus on value is definitely um, more useful than, than the pricing conversation oh it is and i think what people have to also remember is that when you're putting out the products and services and you're creating that value it has to be something of quality because i've seen too much out there where people are promoting products and courses they create that are utterly garbage Uh, that if you look at behind the scenes you're wondering you're going to charge somebody a couple thousand dollars when essentially the core of what you you're trying to sell them, you put into the presentation video to sell it. So things like that are problems in the world because if there's nothing of of substance, sure, you might make sales in the beginning, but then as word gets out, guess what happens? Mm. People say, don't buy it. It's not worth it. Just go watch this one little YouTube video. You're fine. And it's a growing problem in the online marketing world because people have fallen into trapping like with all the gurus like oh yeah just put this course out there but there's no substance you become a one-hit wonder you think of all the bands and artists over the years where they had that one hit like like enjoy your your 13 minutes of fame because they're not going to make it to 15 unfortunately and that's it like they have that one song and then poof that's all you ever hear from them and there's gonna be so many entrepreneurs because they didn't spend enough time to put something of quality together they have that one hit that does okay but then people realize there's nothing to it. So when they put out something else, people looking up, no, not buying it, and they move on. Yeah, and I think that is the danger of all those, again, sort of magic formulae to success. And I think, apart from the quality of the contents, I mean, I I just don't think there is a magic formula, certainly in the areas that I work in, you know, whether it's actually, yeah, your business marketing strategy. I could certainly, you know, write the top 10 tips for (laughs) establishing your brand or business, but that's not the sort of magic that's going to work for everybody without having that conversation, without sort of really thinking strategically about specific questions for you. And likewise, that's why I think one-on-one coaching is so powerful because, again, you can have, I certainly use the same exercises with people and the same process and the same types of fears and things come up. But the most effective is when you can really, um, you know, have those conversations, ask the questions, go with the flow and see where the organic conversation takes you. And I'm never going to be able to distill that into like a magic six step formula to getting what you want from life. <laughs> Unfortunately, that would be much easier to sell um, if you could do some kind of magic, um, you know, 10 steps to everything you ever wanted. But um, I think most of us will realize that that's not, you know, we, as you say, we're looking for that magic pill, but that's not really going to be a sort of a sustainable solution to to what we're really wanting. Right. I I think you can, there is a a formula, but it's it's kind of, otherwise it's a misnomer as you'll have. Here's the four things you must have. You must have a great idea. You must really love it. You have to have a plan to get out to market and you have to have raving fans. That's the high level. And then there's about a thousand things in between. Yes. And many different constellations and combinations and ways to get there. So um, yeah. Right. So, because people know, like, if you don't have these key things, it doesn't really matter. But for each and every business, because there's no two businesses alike, the the exact method is going to be different. Because if you think about it as an example, the the way that people make purchases and think about things, let's say here uh, in Dallas, is going to be entirely different than the way people might buy similar items when they're in London. So you can't use the same strategy. Definitely. And again, you see with the ads that are coming and the videos and things that people are putting out, you know, certain um, or a lot of the material come from the US doesn't really speak to us in the UK. We have a different kind of, um, uh, I guess, tone of voice and we're a bit more 
um, reserved, I guess, you know, there are some aspects of the selling technique that doesn't quite work for us. Likewise, you know, if you go to Greece or Southern Europe, you know, people will be shouting at you at the market stalls and things. And me as a Northern European, I'm quite uncomfortable with that. And that makes me draw away from the market stall, whereas they think that's a very effective technique. So it's definitely, again, understanding your customer, understanding who you are and, and the market in which you're operating. Right, exactly. And, you know, when I hear people saying, oh, just select all of these countries with your Facebook ad and you run it out there. And I'm trying not to do like a face palm, like, oh, my gosh, like, how can you say that? Like, if your messaging is not refined, it doesn't really matter because people forget about that and say, well, how do you know this? Like, well, when you live in different parts of the world, you understand very quickly, just like you said, of how people in Northern Europe are compared to Southern Europe. It's entirely different. So the ad copy, you want to use something that's different. The imagery, the language, all of it is has to be different. Otherwise, you wonder, well, how come it performed so poorly? I like to use this example. It's kind of like offering the world's best steak to a, a vegan. Mm-hmm. It's not going to go over well. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I think as long as you're open to that, I mean, sometimes, unfortunately, or not unfortunately, really, you need to experience these things yourself, right? You need to make the mistakes. And as long as you're open to, you know, tracking how you're doing, asking those questions, understanding what's gone wrong, and then optimizing and trying something else. And that's fine. I think some people are a bit stuck. And they're so again, so excited and passionate about their new Airbnb (laughs) service that um, they just don't, they refuse to um, accept that something could be wrong with it, or that they need to tweak it, you know, so they're not really open to listening to advice. So in that sense, you know, it's, I think they're sort of uncoachable and they're not going to be able to, I don't believe their business is going to be a success, but who knows. But I think you definitely need to be open to, you know, failing fast, as they say, this whole lean startup model now, trying things, learning, asking the questions, just moving forwards and, and, um, and learning, being open to that. Right. And it's interesting you say that because one of the things I love to tell startups when they're going to come up with an idea, like, we have this amazing idea. I just ask him, did you run any type of a survey or market assessment to see if people were actually interested? And so many times, like, well, no, they they have to be interested. I love the idea. Well, congratulations that you love it, but there's not like a billion of you out there to buy it. So you need to ask a few people that are not like your mom, dad, and cousin and uncle. Yes, asking people if they like it, exactly. But again, I think it's like, taking a step back, understanding why are you so passionate about this idea? Is it just that, you, you know, have, is this a problem that you've been experiencing in your own life? Is it, have you found a solution to something that you hear, like all your friends are complaining about something and you found a great solution to that problem? And what are you hoping to get from it for yourself? Because again, whether it's your corporate career or within entrepreneurship, if you're looking to other people's success, you know, I think again, Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, he says he never sleeps and all this stuff. And you get all these articles about people who, get up at three in the morning, they have four hours sleep, they work, you know, some of those things, I, I don't want to live like that, certainly. So if that's what it takes to have that kind of success, you know, that's not the success I'm after. Um, some people start businesses for the, you know, flexibility and time with their family and so on. And then you end up kind of consumed by the work and you just lose sight of your reasons for starting the business in the first place. Um, a lot of people do it for lifestyle design in the sense of sort of Tim Ferriss's four hour work week. And there you're really just doing it sort of as a means to travel and live the life you want. And again, you probably don't want to be setting up some complicated business structure with 20 people reporting into you and and so on. So it's just, again, understanding what is success for you? Why is this meaningful for you? What are you trying to achieve? And and sort of trying to shut out the noise of what your, what your friends are doing, what um, people on TV or whatever are doing, and working towards your own goals that are meaningful to you. you know, and that's so important that you... St- stated that because I see all the time people saying, oh, you've got to get up at first thing in the morning. If you're not getting up at five in the morning, you're not like you're going to be successful in business. So I look at like, I got up at five in the morning for 10 years when I was in the Air Force. I don't want to get up at that time because my creativity, sometimes it hits me at, oh, midnight, one in the morning. So sometimes that's when I'm writing out ideas. It all comes down to what works best for you. Of, because I just don't want to be up at that time. <laughs> That's what it really boils down to. Yeah. I stay up until one or two in the morning working exactly. an idea. But that can evolve too. You know, again, when I first quit, I was completely um, rebelling against any kind of structure. I didn't want the alarm clock. I didn't want any kind of calendar appointments and so on. I just wanted freedom. And I saw that as a core value. And I was sort of building my whole business based on that. Um, I was traveling 
a lot and I was nomadic and so on. And now recently I've sort of, I don't know, I've had a lot of freedom. <laughs> so now I'm mm. seeking a bit more stability maybe and a bit more belonging and um, having sort of longer term relationships. I feel more anchored to London now. I've met someone in London. My friends are here. I'm beginning to build business relationships here too. And, you know, a few years ago that would have been awful and like oh my gosh I definitely don't want to end up in London and I don't want to be tied anywhere and now I've sort of come to that but for for different reasons that I would have maybe a few years ago so again it's keeping an eye on that and reassessing at least I guess on an annual basis but you know just checking in now and then and hang on a second do I still want what I was working towards because otherwise you might end up five ten years down the line you've created something successful but it's not actually what you wanted and that's that's a bit of a shame it's a bit of a waste of time and um, it's going to be very unsatisfying and unfulfilling when you actually achieve it. Oh yes, it, it, you have to do that. It's people don't think about what they want. You know, it's, it's kind of funny in terms of how many people say that you know, with alarm clocks. And ironically, the vast majority of time, I don't use an alarm clock. But here's the funny thing: I've trained my body to get up at whatever time I tell it to. So it's like most of the time, like this morning, I said, "All right, I need to get up at six o'clock so I can get started on things." Guess what time I woke up? Six. That's amazing. Alarm clock. <laughs> oh yeah, but I've just done that for so long. I've just trained my body, and and it's it's, it's interesting how it will happen. I was like, I'll wake up, and I'll look over the clock, like score. So I give myself like literally first thing in the morning, I'm smiling, thumbs up, like I'm just that good to wake up at that particular time without looking at the clock until I wake up. And that's fantastic. And if that works for you, and if you enjoy that, and that you know almost gives right. it like a little win when you wake up, hooray! Wow, I'm so amazing. I managed to do it again, kind of thing. I think um, I've you know you can set some people aren't morning people, so you also need to go for where your energy is. They might need a late late um, a late alarm or just wake up naturally, but then they'll work late into the evening because that's when they do their best creative work. Um, some people you know want to take Friday afternoons off to be with their children. Some people want to get up early, go for a run, meditate. And it's just about sort of, yeah, going where your energy is and structuring your time in a way that fits fits you and your family right. and other obligations you have, of course. Right, exactly. That's what business should really be about. It's defining what you want and how you want it. It's all about that lifestyle. If you want to have that, the typical type of corporate business where it's like, oh, I would have 100 employees, we'll build it. But at the same time, if you want to have that flexibility to just go to the airport and say, all right. I'm going to go visit friends wherever and just build a go. Well, then you have to build it accordingly. Yes, exactly. 100%. That's really sort of the core idea that I've arrived at now. It's about sort of redefining what success means to you personally. And, you know, again, stripping away all those sort of learned um, expectations and obligations and ideas that have been imposed by other people, whether it's the media or schools. Um, I always tell the stories of, well, my mum kept all my school books <laughs> and I grew up, you know, in the English quite strict educational system and all my school books from primary school through to secondary, they all have this red pen, you know, saying good girl, Anna, and this is the standard we expect from you, Anna, um, you know, gold star and all that stuff. And then you've got the too many mistakes, Anna, um, not good enough, Anna, too creative, I think, was on one story that I'd written <laughs> a bit out there. And, you know, and those kinds of messages are certainly not useful in today's society where it's all about that entrepreneurial mindset whether you're an entrepreneur as they say in the corporate world or you're, you're actually starting your own business but it's just it's taken me years to strip away that kind of good girl mentality of trying to live up to what people expected of me doing the right thing and so on and, and really get to the core of who I am what I believe is the right thing and then again that overused word but being authentic to that and that's I think the best thing we can do and it's the way we're going to thrive and, and deliver the best work if we can find work that fits our strengths our values and, and ultimately, I guess, our desires. You know, it's important that you mention that because you, regardless of where people grow up in the world, if you look at the institu institution of education, there's so much of that programming that we have to deprogram ourselves of in schools because it, you think about all the grading systems, like, oh, you have to get the best grade possible. Oh, you have to make sure this is perfect. But then when it comes to being an entrepreneur, you have to get away from that and realize, the only way you're going to have results is you have to put it out there and then worry about making it better later because if you're always trying to perfect it, you'll never get the darn thing out there in the first place. No, and the, the grades is interesting because to be honest, again, I was the good girl. I really got good grades. I, I was valedictorian. I went to Oxford and no one has ever asked me once what, you know, what degree I got. They never asked for a coffee of my certificate. 
Right. Um, I was thinking the other day, I, you know, I have a group of friends now who are incredibly sporty and they're amazing at golf, cricket, tennis, rugby and so on. I think in a way that's almost a more important life skill that they've learned at school. I think, you know, in, in everyday life, it's much um, more important to be sort of well-rounded, you know, to play musical instruments, I don't know, to sport, social skills, um, you know, be creative and so on, rather than having, you know, the perfect grades on your essay or whatever, which is not directly... Certainly in England, the, the things we study at university aren't actually usually being used. You know, people will study geography, biology, whatever. So university becomes more of sort of just a stamp to say, yes, you can manage your time, you can deliver work, and you'll sort of have a certain level of intelligence, I suppose. But it's um, in a way, it's quite an odd thing, because I always assumed, it's that sort of conveyor belt again of, of course, you're going to go to school, university, get a good job, blah, 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 and suddenly you realise, hang on, <laughs> I'm not sure if this is um, serving me really. Right, exactly, and it. It's strange you mentioned that because I think of all the classes I took over the years and how many of them I look back and think, when am I ever going to use any of this knowledge? Some of it was just little check boxes. Well, you have to take this. Well, why? Because it it's for this program. It's so that way you're, you're well rounded in this. Like that has nothing to do with what I really want to achieve. But okay, I will go with it. Like, so some stuff you just have to look like whatever and go with emotions. But at the same time, it's it does people a disservice when all the emphasis is just on grades instead of let's show people the life skills that they need. You know, if I, I had a conversation not too long ago. Some people were asking about, well, does it make sense for people to still go to college and get a degree? I said, well, yes and no. If your intention is just to go there to study books, then no, it will not serve you in the least bit. But if you're going there to learn how to build the right relationships and gain the critical thinking skills you need to be successful, then yes, because you think about it, of how many places you can go to where the people you meet, they can be leaders in a community, they can be world changers, all of this stuff. But it's a matter of putting yourself in the right area for that. Yeah, and it's asking those questions. And, you know, for some people, it is the right thing. Um, I go back to a lot of schools and universities now talking to students to try to help them sort of make the right career choices, whatever that means in the first place. And I talk a lot about career capital. And, you know, you can build that. And again, as with Procter & Gamble for me, certainly Oxford, you know, you open certain doors and some of those things, whether it's the things you learn or in a way... Uh, I mean, I would never say that people should do something just for their CV, but, you know, some things do look good on the CV and they make certain things possible. So as long as you know why you're doing it and, and the possibilities it's going to open for you and so on, I think that that's definitely still got a part to play. And again, I had the most amazing time. Um, but I have a friend who did an undergraduate at Oxford, master's at Cambridge, worked in, you know, a, a major think tank, top consulting company, is now doing a Stanford MBA. And I just think... But what what else are you learning? <laughs> like, is this is this just now prestige, or is it really adding, as you said, life skills or sort of substantial new knowledge that's really going to add value to your life, to the people that you're working with? I'm not sure. And again, that's an individual choice, and I certainly don't mean to judge other people's decisions. But I think, you know, just looking at success and um, achievement in a sort of more holistic way um, is is healthy. And again, considering. Yeah, your family and your personal goals, your health and well-being, your love life, you know, all these aspects of life that are that are so important that won't be visible in the CV. Right, exactly. They're not going to show up like of, on, on the page two, your love life. <laughs> yeah. You just can't quantify that like, well, there wasn't one. I was in school for three decades. You know, that's that could yes, be helpful. Yes, I worked 100 hour weeks or whatever, exactly. Right, I hustled. I followed the, the hustler plan plan that said you do this you're going to be successful and the only thing they did was realize they're addicted to coffee <laughs> yes but i am quite addicted to coffee though i have to admit so that's uh, still a bit of advice <laughs> but you know you have to have some vice in life right right exactly you just got to pick and choose you know, very carefully so as we begin to wrap everything up here what is one thing that you recommend for entrepreneurs to do to really gain clarity about what they should be doing in business so I love this because um, my coaching business is actually called One Step Outside. Um, so it's based on the quote, there's different versions of it, but something like everything you've ever wanted is one step outside your comfort zone. Um, and I always like to leave people with that one step. So I think that's great. Um, for me, as I've mentioned a few times, it's really about looking at what success means to you. 
Um, and there are a few ways of doing that. Interestingly, I think a lot of people talk about doing vision boards, and I did that a while ago for my personal life, but or for life as a whole, I guess. Um, but recently I did it specifically for my business, and I think that's quite an interesting exercise to do. You know, um, in my case, I'm quite digital, so I Google get images, um, but really a more creative way of doing it is grabbing some magazines and flipping through and finding sort of the inspirational images that, um, that sort of uh, inspire you and, and excite you, I guess, about what you're trying to create in the business. And then putting that up in a really visible place, I think, is a great reminder. Um, you know, there are a few other things you can do if you're more of a writing person. I'm more writing. You can even just sort of do a free writing exercise when you set a timer for three minutes and just write nonstop, just complete the sentence. You know, for me, success is dot, dot, dot. Um, and make sure that you consider career, business, finance, relationships, love and so on, as we said. Um, and uh, another couple of exercises, actually, one of my favorites is the rocking chair exercise, um, which you may have heard of. You imagine that you're 100 years old. You're sitting in that rocking chair in a home for the elderly in years to come and you look back over your life um, and just ask yourself, you know, what needs to have happened for your life to feel like it's success for you to have no regrets? Um, and there's a book by Bronnie Ware, I think she's called, an Australian nurse who worked in palliative care. So with people who were nearing the end of their life and she wrote the top regrets of the dying. Um, and, you know, they were as you'd expect. I, I wish I hadn't worked so much. I wish I'd um, let myself be happier. I wish I'd spelt, spent more time with my loved ones. But number one is I wish I'd um, had the courage to let myself live a life that was true to myself rather than um, what other people expected. And I think that's so powerful. And I think it's a good idea to learn from these other people who've already lived the next, you know, 50, 60, 70 years. Um, and they're giving us a chance to to address that before before we get old and have those regrets. So I think, again, taking a step back rather than um, yeah, giving another marketing strategy or something, just put, put the marketing strategy down for a second, <laughs> take a step back and, and think about what you're really trying to achieve um, to understand what success looks like for you. And, you know, I think that is so powerful because it doesn't really matter what marketing strategy or what business strategy you come up with in the world. If you're not being true to yourself and you're really looking at life of what is it that does it mean to you to live it? Everything else is meaningless. Absolutely. And meaning, so, I think, I mean, another book just to throw in there is a man's search for meaning by Viktor Frankl. He was a oh, psychiatrist yes. who um, survived the Holocaust and concentration camps. And it's just talking, you know, cause often we talk about happiness and in a way happiness is great, but it's a little bit empty potentially. And he talks about the fact that it's meaning, really, that's the ultimate sort of goal in a way, or the thing that really gives us that purpose and that, that drive and, and makes for a fulfilling life in the end. Right, exactly. Well, I want to thank you for coming into the podcast today and sharing your wealth of wisdom. How can people learn more about you and ultimately connect with you? Yeah, so as I said, the business is called One Step Outside. So my website is onestepoutside.com and Facebook page also One Step Outside. Um, and I have, you know, some free resources on there in terms of finding your dream career and defining your business goals, a few little ebooks um, on, on setting goals and getting into action and so on. Um, and also, of course, offer my individual coaching programs on there. So hopefully, um, you know, if you're highly motivated and I guess have achieved some level of success or a lot of success in the traditional sense of the world, world but um, beginning to question what that means, then, um, then I'd love to talk to you and see how I can support you in redefining success. Oh, that's awesome. Well, once again, thank you for coming on to the show today. Thank you, Byron, for having me. It's a pleasure. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for listening to the Big Movement Podcast today. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Now that you've surely been inspired to take your entrepreneurial career and business to the next level, you can stop by the website and get more. And if you're ready to boost your business brand, be sure to grab your free report, Seven Easy Steps to Build Your Brand Today.